Aloha, and welcome to this month's episode of Live from Noir Lab from Hawaii. My name is Jamika, and I am an outreach assistant at the International Gemini Observatory, which is a program of NSF's Noir Lab. Joining me today uh, in the YouTube chat is my colleague, Leinani Losi. So please, those of you who are in the YouTube audience, um, we're going to be doing something a little bit different if you've joined us before. Normally, we receive our questions through uh, and comments throughout the presentation. But with today's special guest, um, you can still, of course, post your comments and questions. And Leinani is going to hold those questions and comments until our special guest has finished their presentation. And then they will invite questions and comments. So don't let that hold you back from adding those comments and questions in the YouTube chat. So thank you so much, uh, Leinani. OK, um, I will. Go ahead and just start with a very brief intro to uh, Gemini Observatory. We have a lot that our special guest is going to cover, and I really want to make sure they have as much time as possible. So very quickly, here. Um, if you've joined us before, then you've seen this, but if you haven't, let me give you an introduction to the International Gemini Observatory. Um, the International Gemini Observatory is one of five programs of NSF's NOR Lab, which is the preeminent U.S. National Center for Ground-Based Nighttime Optical and Infrared Astronomy. Gemini Observatory is composed of twin telescopes, Gemini North, located on Mauna Kea at an altitude of 13,382 feet, a little over 4,000 meters, and of course, Gemini South on North Central Chile's Cerro Pochon. Now, both Gemini telescopes, of course, observe invisible and infrared light. Gemini's eight meter reflectors collect this light with mirrors that are coated with a special layer of protected silver, which is different uh, than traditional coating uh, for large telescopes, which is aluminum. Now, the mirror is actually made of ultra low expansion glass, and it's about 20 centimeters thick. And you can see here um, those vents open. And oh, oops. Those vents open. Um, at night, and that allows the cold night air to flow through the observatory, which actually helps to produce stable images. Now, because Gemini Observatory has telescopes in both hemispheres, that allows Gemini to be able to see the entire night sky. Now, um, after this, uh, after we finish our presentation and this video is posted on our YouTube channel, you will be able to download um, this Gemini video if you would like. Okay, I'm going to stop my share and I will invite my special guest to turn on their video. Yes. Okay, and we're gonna jump right in with an introduction. All right, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest, Patrick J. McCarthy, the director of NSF's NORA Lab. Patrick J. McCarthy is an astronomer whose research is focused on the distant universe and galaxies that harbor supermassive black holes. He has worked on instruments for the Hubble Space Telescope and led the giant Je Magellan Telescope project for several years. He joined Aura in 2019 as the first director of NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. Welcome, welcome, Patrick J. McCarthy. We are so very pleased to have you with us today. Well, aloha and mahalo, and thanks so much to Jamika. I and am Lani. not able to hear you. I've got myself unmuted. You don't hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me, Jamika? Is that better? 
Can you? I, I hear you loud and clear. It sounds like Lilani can hear me. Okay, fantastic. All Thank right. you. Great. All right, we're all set for you to Good. go. Thank you so much. I was just saying aloha and mahalo to you for inviting me and for everyone else for joining. Why don't I just dive in and share my screen and we will get started here. So I had entitled my um, presentation, A Decade of Discovery, but I thought about it. It's really a decade and more that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna take a little bit of a look back, mostly a look forward. And what we're gonna talk about is this thing we call um, the Decadal Survey of Astronomy and Astrophysics in the United States. And really why that is so important to us, important to astronomy, important to Gemini, and important to NORLAB. We can then talk about the, the scientific priorities that came out of that and really focus on one of the key issues, which is how do we search for life elsewhere in the universe? Because I think all of us, when we've gone out and looked at the night sky at one time or another have wondered, is there somebody out there looking back at us? You know, that would be nice to know. You know, are we really alone in this giant cosmos? Or is there teeming with life and their life elsewhere? And that's often been a subject for science fiction, for speculation, but it's really a scientific question now. And we have the prospect of addressing that and answering that possibly in my lifetime, but certainly more likely in your lifetimes, because you know, I'm getting kind of old. And I think the next generation may be the first generation to know that we're not alone in the universe. I'm gonna talk a bit then about the history of telescopes because they're really our vehicles for exploring the universe and look ahead then to the future to talk about what's come out of this decadal survey process and what it means for us and what it means for this question of the search for life elsewhere. So let's just dive right in. So every 10 years, uh, astronomers around the country and in other countries as well, this happens in Canada, it happens in Korea, it happens in Europe, we get together and we make a long range plan in the US, this is led by the National Academy of Science. And that's really sort of the top few percent of scientists in the country. And um, they get together and they look at the scientific opportunities, figure out which ones they think are most important. And from that, then they derive a list of priorities for investment by the National Science Foundation, by NASA, by others. And that's intended to lay out the plan for what happens in the coming decade. These sort of you know, expert activities, we often call them these uh, navel gazing because everyone gets together and looks down and tries to decide what's happening in the future. But these are real experts. So it's really more like advanced navel gazing that we're doing. And we bring together astronomers, professors, all kinds of very learned people. And one of the nice things about the decadal process that just wrapped up is that it was more inclusive than ever before. It had people from a wide range of institutions a wide range of walks of life, a good balance in gender, a good balance in career stage. It was really the most inclusive and, and overall balanced and engaging process yet. And that was real progress. They also came up with some really interesting ideas and to look forward to the future. But let's step back and talk a bit about what the decadal survey has meant to astronomy and meant to the facilities that we all know and love. The first decadal report came out in 1960. It kind of looks like it was written by hand there. It says 1964. Um, it was a modest document, but it really laid out for the first time a 10-year plan for ground-based astronomy in the United States. And it's vitally important for us because that plan is what led to the four-meter telescopes at Kitt Peak in Arizona and at Cerro Tololo in Chile, and really the whole concept of a powerful national observatory that's open to anyone who has a good idea um, she can take his or her idea or his idea, um, have it reviewed and get on the telescope and do their science. So that was a big step forward. In 1990, there was a decadal report um, that declared the 90s to be the decade of the infrared. And they called for the construction of an infrared telescope in the Southern hemisphere of eight meter diameter. That eventually led to the twin Gemini telescopes, one in Hawaii and one in Chile. And it's interesting to note that report came out in 1991 and the telescopes were finished in about 2000, 2001. So it took about 10 years from the vision in the report to actually putting the telescopes on the sky. In 2010, the report was called New Worlds and New Horizons, and that led to the construction of the Rubin Observatory, which is coming near to completion in Chile, and it will take um, the world's first really deep multicolor movie in essence of the sky. And every few nights it'll map out the entire sky to look for what moves, what varied in brightness, what exploded, what disappeared. That'll be really a profound resource for understanding the universe 
on the very largest scale, but it's these large individual telescopes that allow us to look at details, whether that's stars when they form, galaxies as they, um, as they evolve, black holes as they swallow matter and re-emit some of it out in high energy radiation. And now in particular, um, to look for planets orbiting around other stars. So the 2020 Decadal Report just came out in November. Uh, there's the cover, and the cover actually says a lot about what the report is about. You see four large planets illustrated there. You also see something that looks like two white things, you know, colliding with each other and a jet coming out. Those are supposed to be neutron stars or black holes colliding in the most violent events in the universe. And then in the background in red, you see massive star forming regions coming together to create galaxies in the early universe. And that relates to the themes of exploring planets in our own neighborhood, looking out to energetic events that create heavy elements and create black holes, and then understanding how those black holes and the galaxies that they live in evolve together. But if you look at that bottom little planet, there's a little squiggly line around it. The idea there is that's a spectrum of its atmosphere. And we're gonna to talk today about how those atmospheric spectra can be used to find signs of life on other worlds. So what the group recommended uh, for the ground was the construction or really the completion of two telescopes that reach about 30 meters in diameter. So remember, Gemini is eight meters. So we're talking about things that are roughly three times larger or 10 times the collecting area, one in the north, one in the south. So like Gemini, as Jamika said, will have the full sky coverage. We can see anywhere in the sky with these telescopes that would be a factor of 10 more powerful than the largest telescopes we have today. So that's a very ambitious um, vision. But fortunately, there's been roughly 20 years of work bringing these telescope concepts to a pretty mature state technically, and now we need to get on with their construction. But we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about the scientific possibilities that they will open up. And then we'll talk a little bit about what they will look like when they're finished. So the decadal surveys had had three themes. They call it new worlds and new suns, um, new messengers and new physics and cosmic ecosystems. What that really means is um, finding life on other planets, um, looking at exploding stars and colliding stars and trying to understand dark energy and what it is and how it evolves. And lastly, as I mentioned, how galaxies and black holes evolve together. Um, these are all really interesting topics and we could spend a lot of time diving into each of them. But today we're really gonna focus on this question of life elsewhere, life on planets outside of our own solar system because that seems like a pretty profound question and one worth um, a lot of careful thought. So let's dive into it. Um, when I was a beginning astronomer, we didn't know of any planets outside the solar system. In fact, some of the experts told us there probably aren't any such planets. And if they were, we'd never find them. Now we know that the, the Milky Way is teeming with planets. And so this little um, interesting animation, it's called an orrery. It shows a wide variety of planets discovered by the Kepler satellite. And let's just talk about what we're seeing. All the little things moving around are planets orbiting around their stars. And we're not showing the stars just to make it simple. The dotted lines is our own solar system for comparison of scale. And in this animation, one Earth year takes about 30 seconds. So you see all these stars, these planets zipping around. They're going pretty fast. Most of them have pretty short years. They're color coded. The red dots are planets that are very hot. They're probably molten or super hot gases. The white planets are hot like the temperature of Venus and the blue ones are like Earth. Blue is cool, blue is nice. So you can see there's lots of blue planets here. The size of the dot reflects the size of the planet. The biggest ones are the size of Jupiter. The smallest ones are the size of Mercury. And the key thing here is there's lots of blue planets about the size of the Earth and Neptune. And those are planets where things might actually live. And there's plenty of them. So we now know that there's a very diverse range of planets in the Milky Way, and many of them are in places that can harbor life. So what we now know is that, um, as I said, there's a wide range of planet types. The first ones that were found were pretty scary. They were what we called um, roasters in the sense that they were planets the size of Jupiter, but in orbits that are smaller than that of Mercury. So they're very close to their suns. They're very hot. They're literally roasting or boiling away. We think those are planets that formed far away from their stars and migrated in and will eventually be um, dissolved or coalesce with their stars. So they're not a good place necessarily to look for life, 
but they're an interesting indication of how diverse planets are. Then we found other planets that were frozen worlds so far from their suns that not much was going to be happening because there's not a life happening on inside of ice. It's pretty, pretty tough to have biology in ice. There's some very intriguing worlds that appear to be nothing but bottomless oceans, real water worlds. Um, we don't know much about them. There's been much um, discussion as to whether they really exist or not, um, but they're quite intriguing. But what's of most interest to us is the most common type of planets are roughly the size of Neptune or Uranus, about 10 to 50 times the mass of the Earth, but in orbits that are more like that of Venus. And since most stars are cooler than the sun, many of these planets are in what we call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot and it's not too cold. It's kind of just right. And by what I mean just right is that water would be in its liquid state. Because ice is not a great place to do biology. And a world that's nothing but steam, it's hard for things to form. But in a world like ours, where most of the water is liquid, is a really interesting place. And it turns out that roughly one out of three stars has a planet that's rocky in that zone that's kind of just right for water to be in its liquid phase. Those are the objects that are of interest to us. So we might ask, well, how many of them are there really? Because we sample small parts of the sky and then we can extrapolate to how many are in the galaxy. And it turns out there's about 50 billion habitable zone planets in the Milky Way. Even to an astronomer, 50 billion is a pretty big number. So if you're a pessimist and say, well, maybe only one in a million of planets that could have life would have life, well, that's 50,000, okay? Well, if you're a super pessimist and you say, well, maybe it's only one in a billion, okay, well, 50 planets, it'd be hard to find them. But if you think beyond just the Milky Way, it's a big universe of galaxies. And when you look then and ask, well, how many habitable zone planets are there in the entire visible universe? That number is 10 to the 22nd power. That's a big number. So if we're alone, we are really, really special, no doubt about it. Unfortunately, we can only study a small number of these planets in any great detail. They have to be close to us. They have to be around stars that are bright enough to get a good signal, but not too bright to lose the planet in the glare. But we'll look at this handful of stars and ask ourselves, you know, can we find out if something really interesting is going on there beyond just geology? So how would we do it? How would we look for life on planets around other stars? Well, we could listen for it. And so there are radio astronomers out there doing fascinating experience of pointing their radio telescopes at various stars and seeing, can they find signals that are signs of intelligent life? They haven't found any yet, but I think it's a really important experiment. We can look for them by actually sending satellites out to Mars or to other um, moons around Jupiter and Saturn to see is there any biology under the surface. Um, or we could try to smell for life. And what I mean by smell is we sample the atmospheric gases to see are there indications of biological processes going on. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the idea is to use um, atmospheric biomarkers that allow us to tell the difference between a world that might just have geology going on, say volcanoes and plate tectonics, from worlds that are living. And the way we can gauge what that might look like is to look at the history of the composition of the Earth's atmosphere as it went from its early formation phase to the way it is today. So when the Earth formed, its chemistry was fairly similar to that of Jupiter uh, and other large planets, at least as atmospheric chemistry was. But the Earth is not massive enough. Its gravity is not strong enough to hold the light elements like hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere. So they evaporated and boiled off to the outer solar system very quickly. The, the complex molecules like ammonia and methane that form in, um, in molecular clouds when the, when, the star, when the sun and the solar system was formed, they get destroyed fairly early on when the Earth is still very hot. And the Earth is kind of like a sauna for a billion years or so, where there's high density of water vapor, it's all in steam, there's carbon dioxide coming out from volcanoes. But eventually after a couple billion years, it settles down and something remarkable happens starting about two billion years ago, oxygen starts to appear in the atmosphere. And by about 500 million years ago, about 20% of the Earth's atmosphere is in the form of oxygen. And we know that oxygen comes from biology because if all the plant life in the world, which is where the oxygen comes from, if that all just stopped tomorrow, 
the oxygen that's in the atmosphere now would disappear over about 100,000 years because everything left on the planet would rust. So not just the metal, but the rocks themselves oxidize. And so the red rocks you see in, in Arizona, as opposed to the rocks you see in Hawaii that are very young, they've all oxidized and they've consumed some of that oxygen. So the fact that oxygen exists for hundreds of millions of years or even billions of years shows that there's biology going on that constantly replenishes that oxygen by taking it out of the CO2 um, and the H2O to make hydrocarbons and oxygen in the atmosphere. So if we could see that oxygen in other planets, we have a pretty good idea that something interesting is going on. But we need more than just the oxygen. We need a combination of molecules that are a clear signature of biology as opposed to um, geology. So this little cartoon illustrates how we might tell the difference between a barren world that is dead but full of volcanic activity and a living world. So in a barren world, we might see carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and oxygen in the form of ozone, O3. But in a world with life, we would see carbon dioxide, diatomic oxygen, what we're familiar with, and methane, because the methane on the earth comes from rotting vegetation, whether that's rotting on the ground or more common in the stomachs of large animals like cows. And that methane comes out, some of it comes out the front, some of it comes out the back, but it comes out anyway, and that's a tracer of big animals on the planet. So if we could see that signature of oxygen and methane, that tells us something really exciting is going on. So let's look at the solar system just to get a gauge of what the planets tell us. If we look at Venus, we see carbon dioxide, but not a lot else. And it's very dense, it's very hot. You know, Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and that's why Venus um, is much, much hotter than the earth. It's not just because it's closer because all the radiation is trapped. If we look at Mars, we also see carbon dioxide, but the atmosphere is thin, it's cold, and the spectral features are very sharp and they're very narrow. They look quite different than they do on Venus. And then if we look at the Earth, we see all kinds of stuff going on. There's water, there's ozone, there's carbon dioxide. If we look in the infrared, there's methane. And if we had a very good spectrograph, you could see the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. It's hard to detect, even though it's 20%, um, just like the nitrogen is hard to detect, even though it's about um, 70%. But you can see that oxygen feature, and that's a sign that something interesting is going on. Well, for the planets in the solar system, we can easily measure their atmospheres just by looking at transmission from the light coming off the reflection from the sun. It's a little harder to do that with other planets. But here's how we do it. We find planets in which the alignment of their orbit is such that the planet passes right in front of their parent star. Some of that starlight is blocked by the planet itself. Okay, we lose that. But some of it goes through the atmosphere. And within that atmosphere, some frequencies are absorbed by molecules. Others just pass through. And so we look for the spectral signatures and say, what light... Um, from the star is missing, in particular, look for light in wavelengths where water absorbs or carbon dioxide absorbs or sodium and so on. And from that, we can detect the composition of the atmosphere by differencing the spectrum of the star when the planet's in front of it and when the planet is behind. And so here's an example of data taken for a massive Jupiter-like planet passing in front of its star. And the little black dots are the measurements and the blue lines are the model. And the model has water in it. And you can see the model matches the data and shows that there's actual H2O in the atmosphere of that giant planet. So that's exciting. Water is, is a, a key ingredient for life. And it looks like water is pretty common throughout the galaxy. So we know that there are some planets that have water, but that in itself is not enough. But this illustrates the technique that we'd want to use but we'd like to apply that to rocky planets, planets like uh, the Earth or super Earths. But it turns out the measurements are really, really hard. So I'm gonna show you here two sets of measurements, one from the European VLT and another from Gemini. And you can see the data is kind of noisy. Those are the black or red dots. The models, well, most of them fit. What we can say about this one planet on top, it's an Earth-like planet and its, and its atmosphere doesn't look like the sun. Okay, that's no surprise, but we can't really see individual features yet, particularly not from oxygen or not even from water, except in a few rare cases. And these are measurements that have precision of, of a few hundredths of a percent. 
but we need to get down to a few thousands of a percent if we're going to see these other biomarkers. So the bottom line is, while we're learning a lot with Gemini and other telescopes, we just need a bigger telescope if we're going to find these biomarkers in the atmospheres of planets um, that are tens of light years away from us. And that's really what this decadal report is about, is, is using this desire to look for life elsewhere to drive the technology to build bigger telescopes that are precise, that have the right instruments to do this particular experiment. So let's go back and, and look at the early history of building telescopes. You know, Galileo's telescope was only a couple inches across. Um, it had 50 times the collecting area of the naked eye, which was a big step forward. You could see um, stars down to 11th magnitude, and you could see an angular resolution that was poor by today's standards, but it was enough for him to see um, spots on the sun, craters on the moon, the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus. And from that, he realized uh, that it was no doubt that the earth goes around the sun rather than the sun and everything else going around the earth. And today we all take that for granted, but it was quite profound in its time. And that launched roughly 400 years of people building bigger and bigger telescopes, exploring the galaxy, exploring the universe. And for much of that time, the first couple of hundred years, it was taking Galileo's telescope design and simply making it bigger and bigger. This is a telescope that uses lenses, but sometimes that kind of gets to a limit. And so this was the world's largest refracting telescope. Pretty hard to use, you know, it's kind of ungainly to point. It takes this big dome, the floor had to go up and down. There's all these levers. Um, it turned out that was kind of the end of that particular technology. And the real breakthrough that we're still riding today is using telescopes that have mirrors in them. And as Jamaica pointed out, the Gemini telescopes, they have a glass mirror with a silver coating. We take that for granted now, but for decades, reflecting telescopes had solid metal mirrors and you had to polish the metal every single day because they tarnished. So astronomers would polish all day and observe all night. There was no time for sleeping. It was not so good. So making glass mirrors with metal surfaces was a huge breakthrough. And this is um, the 60 inch telescope at Mount Wilson. And then there's Hubble at the 100 inch telescope from which he discovered the expansion of the universe. And so the history there is great and speaks for itself in a sense. What I'm showing here is a plot showing the size of the world's largest telescopes from Galileo to you know, a few years from now. And the, the telescope diameter is in a logarithmic scale. So in each equal interval, the size goes up by a factor of 10. And then you see time from about 1607 to um, somewhere in the 2000s. And it's a nice straight line. And what that tells us is there's roughly a constant doubling time in the size of the largest telescope on the planet. And it turns out that's about 35 years. So the 200 inch telescope at Palomar was really finished and really got working in around 1950. And then the Keck telescope came along in around 1995. Well, that's 35 years. Gemini and the other eight meters really got going in around 2000. And so we'd ask ourselves, well, when would the next big leap occur? Well, it should be around 2030. Um, and that's exactly where we are now. Uh, the next big telescopes um, will be done in around 2030. The heart of the Gemini telescope, as you saw at the beginning, are these beautiful eight meter mirrors. They're just, just really works of art and science. They're just extraordinary, um, but they're delicate. They're hard to handle. When people were talking about building eight meter telescopes, they thought it's gonna be so hard to move these mirrors. Why don't we just make them on top of the mountain? We'll just pour the glass and we'll find some people who live on the mountain for 10 years and polish them all and then we'll be done. Well. That's not very practical. So we learned how to make the mirrors at sea level and get them to the top of the mountain. Um, but we also learned this is about as big a mirror as you can make. If you made it any larger than the size of the Gemini mirrors, you really can't move it and it won't behave very well. It's about the limit of what the material will support. So if you wanna make a bigger telescope, what do you do? Well, one approach, um, what we call the Giant Magellan Telescope is to take these big mirrors like Gemini and put several of them together, but in a shape that's a single coherent surface. So the GMT uses seven eight meter mirrors, seven 8.4 meter mirrors to make a 25 meter telescope. And you'll see a little bit more about this. And it has the advantage that you only have to make a few mirrors. There's not a lot of edges around the mirrors, but you do have some gaps and it has some interesting challenges. 
but it brings sort of the best of what we understand about mirror technology to building something that is a factor of 10 roughly more collecting area than what we have today. There's another technical approach that the 30 meter telescope will use, which is to make many, many small mirrors and stitch them together very closely and make a single surface that's 30 meters in diameter. And that has some interesting advantages as well. And it builds on the history of the Keck telescope uh, on Mauna Kea. So there's two interesting technical paths here. It's always good to diversify your investment. So I think this is a nice approach and we'll have these two telescopes that have their own particular strengths and they'll come together to create something that is better than either one by itself. In fact, even better than just two of the same. So this is what they look like. The 30 meter telescope has this enormous dome with an eye. Uh, the giant Magellan telescope has a rotating carousel dome. Um, the telescopes are quite advanced in their engineering um, and essentially ready for construction. As we said, the GMT mirror has seven of these 8.4 meter mirrors. Six of them have already been assembled. You know, the, the glass has been poured. Three of them have been polished, so they're well along on their way. The 30 meter telescope has roughly 500 of these 1.2 meter mirrors and almost all of the mirror blanks have been made and cut to shape and they're learning how to do the polishing. So that is all moving pretty well. And typically for telescopes, the thing that is the hardest to do are the mirrors. And that's why these two projects have invested in the mirrors and why they're quite well along in that process. And the rest of it is, is much simpler by comparison. So this is a nice little video that shows what the giant Magellan telescope will look like. And keep in mind as it, as it opens up and you see the individual mirrors as the mirror covers open, each one of those is a little bigger than Gemini. So think of seven Geminis um, all put together on one mount, all working together like a single telescope. It's a big thing. It's really big. It's huge. Um, but you can see from this, this engineering animation, the engineering is very advanced. So there are contracts now to basically are ready to cut all the metal and put it together. All the design work is now complete. Prototyping is done. The 30 meter telescope has been designing their telescope for a number of years and building prototypes of the parts. They're ready to start cutting metal and assembling. So everyone is ready to go now. We just need to make sure we've got all the financing and all the approvals and all that worked out. And if we can get sort of the green light to start moving, they'll be done in just about 10 years. So let's talk about what our role is here at this national center because the two projects have been working alone for a number of years and now they've come together to create this unification where we're all working together, not just the US, but the US and Canada, Japan, Korea, India, China, Brazil, Chile, holy smokes, it's a real international organization. And our role as the national center in the US is to represent the entire community, to have a voice in decision-making around scientific issues, operational issues, to think about instruments and scientific priorities, and in particular to develop all the software that will allow the users to interact with the telescope and the instruments and the data, and then to store that data and make sure that it's well-supported and anyone can look at it a year later, five years later, or 50 years later. And we're gonna build on the experience we've had with Gemini They've really learned how to make state-of-the-art user support software, how to queue schedule the telescopes, how to run the telescopes at night when nobody's up there, you know, because it's better to not have people walking around in the dome to actually have smart software and observe from sea level where there's enough oxygen so you can think. Remember oxygen, that's what we talked about before. It's important for life. So we're really building a lot on the foundation that Gemini has laid. Because these big telescopes, they're the natural successors to Gemini and Keck, whereas the Rubin Observatory, it's a natural successor to the Palomar Wide Field Telescopes, not to the 200-inch. So together, we build this much stronger ecosystem. But I really see these telescopes as, as the logical successors to Gemini, to Magellan, and Keck. And so it's high time our 30 years is coming around. So what happens next? We're going to work to get input from scientists around the world to make sure we've got all the right plans and designs. We'll have those designs reviewed by the National Science Foundation. That's going to be very rigorous. Um, we'll send new proposals into the National Science Foundation to get into their program that funds big facilities. We hope that will go well. And then construction should run through this decade and we should start to see the mirrors go in the telescopes 
right around 2029, 2030, and in 2031 and a little beyond, really get on the sky. Um, there's lots to do along the way, um, but it's all pretty well laid out now, and it's just a matter of having the will to do it. So what will we do when we're done? Well, it turns out there's a number of really exciting planets out there just waiting to be explored. And there are teams around the world finding them. And this one, it was found just a couple of years ago. It was discovered at Saratololo by a group of Harvard astronomers using these little small telescopes and watching stars to see planets come in front of them. This planet is a Earth-like planet. It's rocky. It's a little bigger than the Earth. It's orbiting a cooler star and it's in this Goldilocks zone where the water would be liquid. It goes around its star every 25 days, so we'll see lots of these eclipses where we can take the spectra. So all we need to do is build these big telescopes, put a big spectrograph on there, and take the data and see what we find. And as we go through this next decade, many planets like this one will be found, and so we'll have dozens of planets that are the perfect place, the perfect geometry for us to look and ask ourselves, are we really alone or is there somebody out there looking at us? And maybe that somebody's a dinosaur, I don't know, or a fish or a hyper advanced civilization. I'd like to know. And I think we actually have the chance to find something out about that in the next decade. So I think it's going to be a really exciting period. There's lots going on. There's lots more in this decadal survey that's of interest to us, but I don't think there's anything more exciting than answering this question, are we alone or not? So thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm Mahalo, and I'd be very interested in questions and discussion. So I will turn it back to, uh, to Leonani and to Jamika. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, <clears throat> fascinating, fascinating. Um, there, there is so much, there's so much to unpack here um, from the decadal. Um, if I may start with the first question, Leinani, I, I can see that there, there are definitely questions and things in the chat. Um, but if I may start, um, for uh, the uninitiated person, Pat, who's new to understanding what the decadal is, um, how, how would you encourage someone to uh, to get into reading this. Um, just like our undergrad students who are just yeah. coming up, starting their careers, this is this is the one that'll that they'll be under for the next 10 years. So right. while they're in school, how how can they digest this document, which right. is so long? I think the first place to start might be to watch the YouTube video of the briefing from the co-chairs. So there's um, a professor at Caltech She's an expert in black holes and in X-ray astronomy and a professor at the University of Arizona who's an expert in, in galaxy formation. The two of them gave a webinar that briefed the world about this. So instead of reading the 400 page report first, you could listen to that hour and a half presentation. Then if you go back and look at the report and simply read the summary sections, that'll give you the big picture. And then you can find whatever section you're interested in read um, the details, science case, whether that's about exoplanets or black holes. If you start to read it you know, from start to finish, you, can, you may get bogged down into a lot of policy stuff that may not be that exciting, but it's important to us. But if you're interested in the science, um, start with the video, then the, the summary part, and get into the panel reports on the science, because those are written, well, this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> yes. They're being written for congressmen, so anyone should be able to understand them. <laughs> great that's a great suggestion thank you yeah I know for me myself um I've I've gone through it I've read some of the summaries but I I don't think I was aware of that that video actually yeah. that would have been um that was something I'm gonna have to go back and check on thank you for sharing that Pat so hopefully it, those of you out in the audience if you haven't had a chance to peruse this amazing document Let's follow Pat's advice and look at the summary reviews, but check out that video first. And we'll have that in the video description uh, once this is posted. Okay, Leinani. Okay, aloha kako to everyone in our YouTube audience and in our chat. Mahalo Nui for being here and for engaging with all of your questions and comments. We have some viewers from Memphis and from Ontario, Canada. 
So we mahalo you for being here despite the time difference to us in Hawaii. Pat also being in a different time zone than the rest of us. We're very grateful for all of you to be here. Um, and so our first question from the chat is from Liz Fleming. And the question is, how is transit spectroscopy affected by global warming? Interesting question. Um, it turns out, of course, that the gases we're looking for in those planetary atmospheres are also in our own. And so one of the challenges separating the light from the planet versus the light from our atmosphere in the Earth, in particular, the Earth's absorption features from CO2 and methane are pretty strong. So as the, the composition of the Earth's atmosphere changes, it makes it maybe a little harder to remove those features. Um, I think it's a pretty small effect. It's more likely that global warming is simply going to make it harder to get good, clear nights. You know, the weather is changing. The weather is more um, violent and unpredictable. And I think we're seeing um, different evolutions in the equatorial zones than we're seeing in the mid-latitudes. I think it's just harder to know where to build big observatories and be confident that 30 years from now, the skies will still be clear. So I think that's where it's impacting it more but it does relate to this challenge of we have to separate what's in the planet atmosphere and what's in our own. And part of how we do that is we use the Doppler effect. As the Earth orbits the sun, there's a little velocity difference and that red shifts or blue shifts the lines in the Earth's atmosphere relative to the planet. And that's part of how we separate them. And as the lines get stronger in the Earth's atmosphere, the harder it will be to make that measurement. All right, mahalo for that. I think Jamika maybe has a follow-up question. <laughs> I do, I do. You know, I that that was that was a great question. I never thought about global warming impacting our ability to to actually do astronomy. Um, I, I I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that as, as an impact. Um, so as we're thinking about where observatories already are right now. Pat, do you foresee some, some places maybe in the next 10 years not being used as much because of global warming? Um, I think we'll find that the places that are dry will get drier. And so I think the places in the Atacama Desert in Chile um, will continue to be outstanding. As we go further north and we get closer to the equator, I think the we're already seeing the sites in the north of Chile seem to have more variable weather than those a little further south, like where we are. And I think in, in Hawaii, you may see more variability in the um, frequency of, of storms. I don't think there'll be any sites that will be made um, unusable, but we may think a bit more about where are zones where it's likely to be um, clear you know, a larger fraction of the time. And we'll put a higher emphasis on being at high elevation because if we're working in the infrared, as it gets warmer, as the ground is warmer and the atmosphere is warmer, that makes more, more radiation that's difficult to, to deal with. So that's why sites like Mauna Kea are great because it's always zero degrees up there at night. And it's always cold because the atmosphere is so thin, but lower elevation sites, I think will suffer a bit. But these are probably pretty small effects. The bigger issues with observatories are light pollution, um, the, the enormous constellation of satellites that are now coming, these are much bigger risks to our observatories than, than evolution in the climate. And that's where we need to really be thoughtful about where we build and how we are good citizens and work with the communities around us so they understand the importance of you know, not having a lot of lights out at, at night. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic point. Thank you. Leinani. Okay, well, this is certainly a very fun topic, and I think that it's something that astronomy is starting to uh, be more aware of and have more um, talks about, even at astronomy conferences regarding global warming, um, because not only will it affect our telescope sites, but it affects the quality of life for many people across the Earth in which we want astronomy to be for everyone, and we don't want people to face um, difficulties in, in quality of life or survival due to global warming um, to be the things that 
deter them from doing astronomy or having access to it. Um, so I was wondering, as a follow-up question, Pat, if you could talk a little bit about what NORLAB is doing to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. Absolutely. Um, as a young astronomer, I was struck when we would go up to the mountaintop, sometimes in very remote places, we were off the grid, uh, but not off the grid in a good way. We used to have diesel generators that would run all the time to generate the power, particularly in parts of Chile. So fortunately, in the past 20 years, everyone has moved now to be on the electric grid, which is better, but we still use a lot of electricity and we wind up putting our telescopes in places that are clear at night, which means it's also clear during the day, right? And so that means we can actually harvest solar power all day in order to store it and then observe at night. And Gemini has been one of the leaders on that and putting in photovoltaics. We also tend to put observatories in pretty windy sites and we can use um, wind turbines if we put them in the right place carefully to not be downstream from the turbulence to generate electricity. And the advantage of wind is, it, is it's windy at night as well as during the day. But what we're doing at NORLAB is we're training, taking a two-stage approach to reduce our carbon footprint. We looked at overall is where do we have uh, the biggest impacts energy-wise and not surprisingly, travel is a big part of our carbon footprint. So we are reducing our travel, that reduces the carbon footprint. And then we're taking every dollar that we save by not flying and spending that on solar cells, more efficient light fixtures, more efficient heating and cooling, um, smart systems that turn off anything that's not needed uh, relatively quickly and that way, Every dollar wins twice because we, we reduce the carbon by not flying and we reinvest that in photovoltaics and other systems that reduce our carbon footprint. So we're aiming to reduce our carbon fit, footprint by more than 50% in just the next few years. And fortunately, in Chile, the government is investing heavily in renewables as they are in Hawaii. I wish our Arizona colleagues were moving as much in that same direction, but what we're doing on top of what the local communities are doing should drive our footprint down very dramatically over the next five years. We'd love to get to a place where we're entirely carbon neutral. Um, I think there are some challenges with that, but we need to look at it. And I'd like to get to a place where we can start to use daytime storage with the, you know, the next generation of batteries and you know, collect the power that we need during the day from the sun and use that to power us at night locally. And I think that's something that can be done economically if the battery storage cost per you know, unit electricity continues to evolve as it is, that price is going down in another five years, I think could be very favorable. Thank you, Pat, for your answer. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here in the chat. We wanna be sure to get to them before our live session is done today. Uh, so our next question is, how do you think the design of telescopes may change to increase their effectiveness for discovery and research in the future? It's, it's a great question because if you look back at that graph I showed of 400 years of big telescopes and it's consistently and steadily getting larger and larger, the history has been some group of people come along and they'll build the world's largest telescope and they will declare they're so smart that no one else can ever make a bigger telescope. And this is the biggest telescope they'll ever be. And then 20 years later, the next generation comes along and they find a new approach and they make something bigger still. So what we've learned over time is that making optics that are lighter, that are more steeply curved, makes the telescope smaller. Making the structures more efficient using modern design techniques um, makes them cheaper and higher performance. Instead of making these enormous buildings with telescope buried deeply inside of them, we make the dome no bigger than it absolutely has to be. But at some point, we'll reach a, a place where it won't make sense to just keep making bigger and bigger continuous telescopes, but to make telescopes and link them together and to use um, techniques that are more aimed at looking at the small scale and using quantum detection and quantum photonics devices to look directly at the sky rather than to refocus the light. So I think as we look at this, what's called the, the third industrial revolution, which is really the quantum revolution, there's a whole new avenue for light detection and astronomy that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And we may find that the next generation of telescope builders take an entirely different approach than what we're doing now. I think that would be really exciting. 
but there's, there is still room to grow even from where we are now. But if you look at that chart, if you ask yourself, when will there be a 100 meter telescope? Probably around 2070. So I don't expect to see it. Um, but the key is to just think outside of the box and innovate. And you can look at Gemini compared to Palomar. They don't look very similar. There's a lot of innovation there. And we saw from Gemini to the, to the GMT, there's a lot of innovation there as well. Very interesting things on the horizon then. Okay, our very last question in our chat is, do the trips by private space explorers jeopardize future missions by NASA and the many crafts that are already in place in space? Um, I don't think so, because right now, <clears throat> these private trips are very short. Um, there are not very many of them. I think the bigger concern of which the private trips are just one element is the overall industrialization of space. The number of satellites and various things out there is going up very, very steeply. And that also means the number of dead satellites and debris or pieces of satellites that have collided or blown up. Um, that's filling the sky with things that are um, dangerous to other satellites that reflect light back. So we've got streaks of all of our images now from new satellites and from space debris. And we could get to a point where there is so much stuff in space, it's kind of hard to see the natural sky itself. And so being able to go out in a dark sky and experience the wonders of the universe is a really special thing. And if we get to the point where when you look up, all you see are um, satellites or God forbid billboards that people are talking about putting in orbit um, or um, pieces of art, um, that would be a shame because there's nothing more beautiful than the natural sky itself. Let's not fill it up with things that we don't really need. So we're trying to work with groups to understand that the sky is a commons and we want to all share it. And it's important that there be industrial uses and communications and all the wonderful things that come from that. But there has to be, should be a room for astronomy for wonder for the night sky as well. So I'm concerned much more about that than the, than the few billionaires who fly up and down. It's the people who wanna put 50,000 satellites um, into orbit so we can all watch cat videos on our phones and watching cat videos is great, um, but we do have to have some balance. Thank you for your answer, Pat. To everyone in our YouTube chat, if you have any more questions, we are nearing the end of our, of our show time. So please enter your questions into the chat and any maybe goodbye comments as well. Some of our comments currently are, mahalo to you, Pat, great presentation. Um, they love the visuals and the exceptional hosts and presenter. Yes, so those are our comments. Um, I did have a follow-up question to the discussion on satellite constellations. I was wondering if you had any more to say about NORLAB's role in these discussions about the constellations. We have been working with um, the National Science Foundation, with um, astronomers around the world, but most importantly, with some of the satellite companies. And I really want to stress that um, SpaceX and others have been very um, responsive and responsible actors. They've worked with us closely to understand how to make their satellites have less impact in terms of reflected light, how to either make them darker or have the light get reflected away so it doesn't shine down on the ground. <clears throat> and all the way up to the president of the company, they understand the importance of working with the scientific community um, to minimize the impact while still achieving their really laudable goals of providing a broadband communication to people in parts of the country or parts of the world where they simply can't have it otherwise. So we really support their mission and the technology they're using is really impressive. It's marvelous. But the great thing is that is the communication we've had back and forth and the progress they've made, they have reduced the brightness of their satellites by um, well over a magnitude. We'd like to see another magnitude if the satellites can get down to about eighth magnitude, we can deal with them in software. And right now they're down around seven and a bit. So that's great progress. So we are trying to work with all the bodies, but really find technical solutions first, understand whether there's more needed in the world of regulation and policy. We don't do that, but we can provide technical input to those discussions. Um, and then we're working with astronomers around the world to help identify and build software tools that will tell us 
when the satellites are coming so you can close your shutter if you need to, or how to remove the satellite streaks and software from your data so that they're not, uh, the data is not overly impacted. Because while the satellite streaks are uh, annoying, they only affect a small fraction of the pixels. We just need to know how to deal with that and how to remove them so we can get the rest of the data out of the images. And, and the Rubin Observatory team is very heavily engaged in that because with such a wide field of view, they're most susceptible to the satellites going through. Gemini won't see them very often, but Rubin would just see them um, in spades. Well, mahalo for that answer, Pat. It's really great to hear about all the collaboration that's going on around this issue. Um, as we all well know, and I'm sure a lot of people in our audience as well, astronomy takes a lot of collaboration across the world to make these discoveries happen um, in, in all parts of it, from software to engineering to the scientists and the telescopes themselves. It's really a worldwide endeavor. So it's great to hear about all the collaboration that's happening regarding the satellite constellations as well. And on that, we have no more uh, comments or questions in our YouTube chat. So I will hand it back over to Jamika. Thank you so much, Leinani. And thank you again, everyone in our YouTube chat and audience watching us. Um, if we could close, Pat, with your thoughts on two things. In this newest decadal, they included a new section, which was the state of the profession. Could you speak a bit on um, your, from your own perspective, why that was included for the first time now? And um, could you also give us a bit of insight on NORA Labs' uh, path forward in trying to address uh, those issues that were brought up? Yeah, I think um, that section was included for the first time because people realized it was long overdue and that it's become clear um, that there is a, a challenge in astronomy and all the physical sciences, but we see this strongly in astronomy and physics that despite the best intentions, we're just not achieving the results we want in terms of getting the most diverse workforce and ensuring that women, minorities, underrepresented group, people of colors, people with different orientations, um, there's just, something is not working in getting them to take that, that energy and wonder that we often have as youth, particularly young astronomers, and finding that path to a successful career. And so they highlighted the need for data and highlighted the data we have shows there's a serious problem and that we need to take actions to address it and that there need to be um, consequences for not being um, successful for poor behavior in the workplace or for um, career and hiring outcomes that simply don't reflect the, the input and the overall composition of society at large, people who want to be astronomers, not actually mapping to those that are. So what we're doing at, at NORLAB is a number of things. Um, one, we've made sure that our leadership team is diverse and balanced. It's our overall workforce needs to evolve to become much more diverse, but we're starting at the top and we built a leadership team that is evenly divided between men and women. It contains um, a variety of various other types of backgrounds. So we start there and we work our way by setting the right example. Within our team, we've um, allowed and encouraged everyone to spend time on diversity activities and given them a place they can charge their time. We will have their annual performance reviews. We'll have a basic competency around diversity activities. So you will not only be rewarded for good behavior, You'll, you'll get, you know, it will be noted if you're not doing something in this area. And then we are proposing um, to the National Science Foundation that we create um, a special fellowship named in honor of one of the great women astronomers of all time, Henrietta Leavitt. Um, and that, that that fellowship be awarded to people who will do great science and spend some of their time on diversity related activities as part of their overall contribution to the field. So we're trying to take proactive uh, steps and recognize that you have to have more than just talk, you have to have action and you have to have accountability that shows you're really delivering on your goals. So we know that we're just a small part of a much larger um, social system, but we wanna do our part and particularly set a good example for others to follow. And we will learn from their successes as well and continually try to improve what we're doing. Absolutely. that is. Amazing! I did not. I didn't know about this. Uh, <clears throat> this award that Henrietta Leavitt. Well, it's a proposal. We're just proposing proposal. it. 
We don't know whether it will be approved. We're going to propose for it, and we hope that it's approved. Um, but it's still in the in the proposal stage. But to, to see and know that these things are going on behind the scenes, uh, working towards making things even more approachable and equitable um, and, and welcoming to, to all people who are interested um, in pursuing astronomy and physics, it's just really, really great to hear. And I have to say that I'm, I'm very proud uh, to be an organization um, that has those values and that I can clearly see and feel every day when I'm in my office, when I'm working with my colleagues. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you so much to our amazing special guest, NORLAB Director, Dr. Patrick J. McCarthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am just absolutely thrilled that you joined us today. And um, for those of you who may have more questions or you would like to know more about the Astro 2020 in the video description, we will have a link to uh, Nora Lamp's announcement about the Astro 2020 and as well as a link to any other discussions that we may have available about Astro 2020. We will also make sure that if there are any additional questions that you add to the uh, in the video once it's posted, we'll try to get those to Pat so that he can answer them. And with that, Pat, I would like to leave you with our last word. We're just slightly over time. It's okay. This has been really fantastic. So we'll leave you with the last word. The last word I think is, is continue to be optimistic despite the challenges around us with the climate, with all that's going on. We're at a special time. We're at the most privileged period, perhaps. We know more about the universe. We know how much we don't know, but we're on the brink of perhaps answering some of the most profound questions. And there's never been a better time to be alive. There's never been a better time to be a young astronomer. And I wish I was one again, because I'd like to see how this all turns out. It's gonna be great. So be optimistic. And be kind to each other because the future is going to be beautiful. Mahalo. That is lovely. And with that, we will also sign off um, for myself. I am very happy to have been here. Thank you all so much. And I will let Leinani close out. Ahui ho, everyone. And see you again for another live from NORLAB next month. <laughs>